Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mad Jazz Show. Uh, I got an exciting new episode for the show for today. Uh, the topic is going to be the, the Peary Reese map solved. And let's see here, I'll just go over my show notes. Yeah, so for today, it's uh, we're going to be looking at some straight lines that reach a around the globe. Connecting ancient sites, pyramids, mountains, ocean ridges, volcanoes, islands, earthquakes, and they also connect to the very shape of the continents, possibly solving Atlantis, and we also are going to discuss the connection to the Anunnaki, and a possible conspiracy to conceal the truth. Okay, so that's basically what we're going to be talking about on the show today. Um, I got the chat going if anyone wants to ask any questions as we go. Um, hopefully I got it set to public this time. Here, just let me check. Last live stream, sorry I did it by accident, put it on private, and no one was able to join the show. Alright, looks like it's on public. Just going to check, make sure that the stream is working. To conceal working. the truth. Okay, yeah, it looks like it's coming the show today. Clear. Um, I got the chat going, Maybe if anyone wants to ask any questions, any questions as we go. Um, um, hopefully I got it set to public this All time. Alright, so yeah, without any chat. further delays, Last I live stream, sorry I did it by accident, put it on private, and I was going to close that one. Yeah, I hope everyone's doing okay today. I know it's been a rather a rough day. A lot of rain in uh, the Americas, or North America at least. Okay, so for the show today, I guess maybe I'll start with my slides. Yeah, that's a good idea. Alright, so the first slide I got here today is just the cover for the show. I'm basically going to be looking over a map here of all these different lines. I know it looks like a jumbled mess right now, but uh, as the show progresses, I'm going to explain what each line is and how I determine them. and. You can already sort of see how it's like shaping the continent here of South America. And the title caption I put for it too is the civilization that Perry Reese got his map from. They knew more than we do today. And I think these lines mapping the shape of the continent is a great example of that. So, yeah, so I guess um, I'll go on to the next slide here. Yeah, and how this all began, too, is uh, Julie Ryder, she uh, runs a group on Facebook or a website called uh, Montana Megalis. And this is just a picture from her website there. I hope everyone checks it out. She pointed out this uh, ancient line that connects a lot of the sites near her and goes down to Nazca. So that's uh, basically one of the first lines that I started researching when I got this whole uh, map put together. Yeah, and here's a picture that, that Julie made, I believe. Let's see. Yeah, it's made by Julie Ryder. And it's just showing that the line continues past all of her ancient sites that she likes to take people on tours to see. Oh, another grid line there. That's neat. Yeah, so this is uh, basically her line, and I took it and mapped it onto Google Earth. And there was also another ancient line. Let's see if I got that slide next. Yeah, there's a video going around on YouTube. It's called like a, a line that goes around ancient sites that'll blow your mind. And yeah, so Julie knew about that line and then she discovered her line. And this is basically what those uh, lines are going to be looking like on the globe. Yeah, and this mega line is pretty awesome. It starts at, uh, what is it? The, the Nazca goes through here let's see if I got another slide for it no not yet All right before I continue with that slide I'll just uh, show you guys on Google Earth here what I'm talking about All right so uh, here's Google Earth and on the left hand side here I got a bunch of columns or folders that I created and each one is one of the hub points where all of these lines intersect I've got one for the Gulf of Mexico, the South Pole, North Pole, Canada, the Equator Points, and the Tropic of Capricorn Points. So I guess here I'll just bring up Julie's line first because that's where it all began. 
Let's see here. Julie's line I have in the Gulf of Mexico point. And I, I named it the Montana line because she, she likes to research those places in Montana. So yeah, this is basically Montana and where the line crosses near Julie's places. And it was a nice Amy Lee, one of the my page viewers, uh, made a comment that I should extend Julie's line further and see where it goes, like in a straight line. And it eventually came to uh, close to Calgary and the, the medicine wheel that it is in Calgary. And it's like an ancient Canadian Stonehenge people like to talk about a lot. Well, I guess maybe not a lot, but a fair bit. And it was neat when I was extending Julie's line here, you could probably see it already, that it seems to run parallel with mountains. And this trend of these lines running parallel with mountains isn't exclusive just to Julie's. It appears to be every line. So we'll get more into that as we go. All right, so the, here, maybe I'll try putting on these and see how it goes. I got a folder here that someone else made called the Megalithic Portal Everything. And it's basically every ancient site around the world just mapped onto Google Earth. So I'll bring that one up here. And hopefully it doesn't crash the, the stream. It's a crap load of data to process. I've got a really major or a pretty decent computer that I use for my show streaming. So it does okay with this, but man, you wouldn't believe, even with a good computer, how hard this is to run without it crashing. All right, so anyways, there was Calgary. You can see how, like, this line is also going to cross over a lot of cities. And there's a saying that, like, cities today are usually built on top of the ruins of older cities. So I think that's maybe one of the cases with Calgary. Maybe Calgary was a First Nations area or city or town. or And then eventually Calgary was built in its place. So, yeah, there's the medicine wheel and the sundial medicine wheel. You can see how it's like crossing all these ancient sites or right in between them. I'll have to see if uh, Julie is going to be able to get her sites added to this map, just so it makes it a little easier for me to show how close it runs to them. Yeah, and you can start to see that all these different medicine wheels, caves, pictographs, almost fall right on top of this line. And even geographic features like Hell Gap, I believe that's in certain canyon. See what do we got here? Badger Hole, Oklahoma. Eh, kind of neat. All right, so I won't spend forever on each line. I'm just going to try to go quick through them. If anyone wants to get a copy of this on Google Earth, I'm going to try to get it put together soon so you can follow along at home while you're watching the video. Pause it and go over any spots that you might want to look into more detail. So it also almost crosses over Houston. Yeah, and there's an old <laughs> kind of a funny thing too. It's like a lot of people say Americans had the entire like U.S. formed by the Freemasons. And apparently the Freemasons might have already had a copy of these lines. So that's why a lot of the cities are also going to fall on top of it. Yeah, so here's where the line goes through the Gulf of Mexico. And once you get into South America... There's pretty much ancient sites everywhere, so it's going to be hard to say that they match up with it, but it really gets neat once you get down to, uh, let's see, where are we here? Ah, uh, yeah, the, the Nazca Lines. So this uh, line is going to run right over the Nazca Lines. And that's like pretty, one of the major ancient sites, like... People always are talking about the Nazca lines. Oh, there they are. So you can see Julie's line goes right over those. All right, so there's a couple other things that uh, this line's going to run over. Not a whole lot in Argentina. And I'll go over it a little bit in the show, but you can see this line here. That'd be the prime meridian. And this line was actually like selected a long time ago, I believe the 1800s, sort of like a, an arbitrary point where people could mark it so that uh, ships and stuff could use it for navigation. 
But as I developed this map, I realized that the prime meridian line is actually identically where it should be in order to match the map that I made. So I'm wondering if maybe yeah, the Freemasons were involved in picking this prime meridian line as well. And it's neat. You can see that the Julie's line is like going along parallel with the side of the, uh, what is this, the Antarctic. So you can see how like this energy field along this line seems to run parallel not only with mountains, but with continents as well. And here's an example where there's like no large islands anywhere around here, but Julie's line goes right through the center of this one. So I think that this, this is proof that the line also interacts with islands. And I guess volcanoes too, because a lot of these uh, islands are creatable by volcanoes. So part of my theory is like that the energy from this line is interacting with things, creating volcanoes, mountains, even ocean ridges are always going to keep running parallel with this line. All right, so here we're going to be running into, yeah, this should spin the globe around so people don't get it mixed up. Now we're on the opposite side of the globe. We're going to be running through a couple more ancient sites. Like Julie's line goes through these ones. I haven't even heard of all these ancient sites because there's basically thousands of them all over the world. But some of them I've heard of. Yeah, it goes through that one, that one. Yeah, not far from Anchor Wat. But we're, we're going to get a, another line that crosses directly over Anchor Wat soon. We'll get to that one. Yeah, and it's neat that there are some ancient sites in China that it goes through. And I'll get into more details about that soon. And here's another location too where it starts running parallel with the continent. Oh, that's neat. A couple spots even way up north. Alright, so now we've got to spin the map around again because we're near Alaska. I'll try not to spin the map a whole bunch. I don't want to make people nauseous. I know I've been working on these maps for about 80 hours total, and man, I'm so sick of seeing spinning globes. It's actually making me seasick. I'm just getting over a concussion too, so definitely uh, I'll try to go easy on the spinning. All right, so that's basically back to the beginning where Julie's line started. So I guess before I continue, I'm just going to take off the ancient site, so... I can use my computer without it crashing. All right, I guess I'm just going to check and make sure everything's working right for the show. Yeah, no one's entered the chat yet, but if anyone does and you just want to type in a message, it'll help me check to see if the, if the chat's working for everyone. Okay, so I guess I'll continue on with the, the rest of the presentation here. See if I got slides. Nah, I guess I'll, I'll wait to show that slide. Not quite yet. Right, so Julie mentioned to me when I was talking to her about her line, and she was saying that uh, she got her idea for the line, or I guess she had considered her idea or the line because she had seen a video about another ancient line. So I'll, I'll add that line to the map now so you guys can take a look at it. And where do we got that one? I titled this one the Mega Line just because it goes over the most like well-known ancient sites and it's the line that's been uh, I guess the, the most popular. There was a documentary about it so yeah, so this line intersects with Julie's line, like right at the Nazca lines, which I think is pretty cool. It crosses a bunch of uh, ancient temples that way. And when it comes through Africa, it goes over the Dogon area. I'm sure a lot of people have heard about the Dogon before. So it's like the serious connection and all that stuff. And here you can see it goes through Cairo. And Cairo would be the big one with like the Great Pyramid and stuff that goes over whole bunch of temples that are important that it goes through that area. And this area, when you get into India and stuff, I believe it's Mo Jendo Daro, or however you say that one. It comes close to there. And it's neat. Yeah, there's a lot of cities that it's going to go near. Dhaka. 
Oh, here was neat too. I was noticing this place. Like the first time someone had this mapped in the documentary, I noticed it went over Anchor Wat. But when I was mapping it on Google Earth, I found it goes way closer to the capital of Laos and uh, all the, the Buddhist temples. So I guess people might not think it's that great because it doesn't go through Angkor Wat, but I think going through these other Laos places are just as important, if not more so. And let's see, yeah, here's where it crossed my line. Or no, which line is that? No, that's Julie's line. Yeah, so there's a couple more cool places that it goes to. And you can see, too, it's always really close to all the islands. Like, if there's any big island around, chances are it's going to land right on the line. Now, I'll see if it shapes the continent at all in this one. Yeah, not so much in this one. I guess it's running parallel, or not really, with the Mediterranean. And these lines may not look perfectly straight, but I mapped them on a globe, so it's like... Because of the round earth and all, it's like you're going to not be looking at like a perfectly straight line, or I guess visually, even though it is. Yeah, so, yeah, I guess I was going over that line, seeing where it goes. Oh, uh, yeah, there it kind of maps the edge of the continent. Here's where it's like mapping the parallel with the ocean ridges. It goes parallel with that continent, cuts the edge of it, maps where the general direction of this giant ridge is going on the ocean floor almost hits the center of those ones. I guess, hypothetically, if you wanted to make the line a little bit wider, I guess it would go right over them. But I tried to make it as narrow a line as possible, just so people aren't going to say it's coincidence, because I made the line super thick. All right, and let's see how many other places it goes through. Yeah, this island it almost landed right on. And what did we find here? Easter Island. So Easter Island's a really popular one for this mega line to go over. And then we're back to the Nazca Lines and Julie's Line. So there's the two lines that this whole mystery basically started from. And um, I guess I was familiar with the mega line already. I had seen that documentary also. So when Julie mentioned her line, I was like, hey, maybe I can find a general pattern that's going to connect all these lines together. So when I looked it up online, like on Google, to see like what other people have like theorized line patterns, because I know ley lines and everything, people have come up with a million different theories. And this one guy drew a pretty cool map where he had this Nazca line center point, and he drew lines everywhere emanating from it. But uh, it's funny because I was thinking, man, that's a kind of a neat idea, but I'm going to add a couple more lines that I know of in uh, North America and then see how it interacts with the pattern. So like I live in this area here in Southern Ontario, close to Toronto. And when I travel to do exploring, instead of going to like Egypt or what are the famous places people go around the world, like Machu Picchu and stuff, I was like, heck, I live so close to like a place where no one's exploring. Why don't I go and explore up North where I live? So I ended up exploring up here, and uh, it was thanks to the research of a professor, uh, what is it, Bill Rhodes, Back Rhodes Bill Steer. He was uh, showing me this location here, and it's a, a Stonehenge. And it's called, uh, well, I call it the Draco Stonehenge, because when I went to explore it, yeah, there's where it is right there. There's a giant Stonehenge there, and it's built in the shape of the Draco constellation. I guess when Bill was there taking a look at it, he only knew about four blocks. So it's like there's so many trees you can see that's like really thick forest. And the government actually came in and surveyed the Draco Stonehenge area and planted more trees to try to block it and hide it because they wanted to preserve it from vandals, I guess. And the First Nations people are still using it as a holy site too. So like if you're ever going to go to this place, don't trash it, don't do anything, be respectful. It's like, I don't want to be the one causing a whole bunch of crap from other people doing it, so. Anyways, I won't make a big lecture here. So I'll just add my line now so that you can see. And uh, it was funny, I was wondering, like, if I put my line here and make it the starting point of the Draco Stonehenge, why don't I make it follow the path of, like, ancient sites that we have in North America? Yeah, I'll put it on so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Hopefully it doesn't crash. 
All right, so there's Julie's line, and there's there. I'll put my line on now, and the suspense. Whoops. Oh, that's the wrong one. All right, mine's in the Gulf of Mexico, so I'll put that one on now. And I titled it the Draco Stonehenge line. Yeah, so there's my line. And it, it follows all the ancient sites. Here, I'll put that up next. Come on, work. All right. Yeah, so you can see Julie's line sort of runs parallel with the mountains and ancient sites. And we got a lot of ancient sites on the east coast running down that direction. And it also runs parallel with the mountains that way. So that's one of the reasons that I did that. And then uh, to connect it, I decided to pick a, a famous spot. And it just so happened that the Draco Stonehenge line connects exactly at uh, Easter Island. Almost exactly where, uh, whatchamacallit, the Mega Line also connects. So this is where the, the mystery started to get really wild. I'm like, hey, it's like... I've added a, a third line that I don't think anyone else has researched before. And it's lining up to make some sort of pattern. And it's like this pattern looks kind of funny at this point. It's like you got an X up here and then just a, the mega line. So I guess maybe before I continue, I'll just go on to the slides. Yeah, so there's the mega line going from Nazca to Giza. And here's a, a picture I also got, I believe, from Julie's website. And it's like, these are one of the examples of where different researchers have tried to lay these lines down and figure out the pattern. And I like this pattern. It's a pretty cool one. Like, I'm not holding anything against it. It very well could be the pattern. It could be more than one pattern. But you can sort of see, like, the Draco Stonehenge would have been up there and running down like that. And so that line really isn't on this map. So that's one of the clues I had. It's like, hey, maybe I should keep looking for a different pattern because the one I'm finding isn't matching. Oh, yeah, and here's the, the evidence I have, too. Like, Julie's line runs right along this fault. Pretty close. Like, you can see the fault's all jaggedy and crap, but it's like, uh, basically, the line goes in that general direction. So that was kind of neat. I guess her line goes like that over the Gulf of Mexico. And then my Draco Stonehenge line also happened to match a fault line that started up there and goes down. And it follows the, the Mississippi. And the Mississippi is also like in a, a fault line too. It's just not listed on this map for some reason. So basically the two lines are running exactly where the fault lines were. So that, that was one of my theories that like, hey, there's a, a good chance that these lines have something to do with energy and the fault line energy. Oh yeah, here's a picture of Bill Steer. He's the guy who helped me with the, the research up north in Ontario. I hope everyone checks out his website. He's got some cool videos, a YouTube channel and everything. It's at www.northernontario.travel and then a bunch of other stuff behind it. And here's a, a really wild part on the blog that Bill wrote about the, the Draco Stonehenge is that the, the rock alignments were used by early native people as power snares to capture spirits, which then can be used against their enemies. Locations like these are known as power spots. So, let's see. Yeah, there's basically a bunch of professors and academics that came in. They dated it to around 6000 BC, or very close to just after the, the Ice Age melted, somewhere in between there. And there's about 14 other cool sites near it, like this mountain here. I call this, uh, or this one's called uh, Mount Keminis. Well, it has, it's like the mountain of the 100 names. Each people that came through with different languages called it a different name. But it's basically a witch's cauldron. And it's like the oldest example of one. So, And it's neat, the, from biblical times too, this is the same style of mountain, like the same elevation that uh, Jesus performed the transfiguration on. So it's kind of a really cool spot. I, mean, I can see why they made it a holy mountain, or the First Nations people declared it as one. And it's called a healing spot. And a shamanist, I guess, was like a type of healer. That's one of the things. But yeah, I'll make a whole video on that. I don't want to spend too much longer. 
So yeah, here's uh, the two lines, Wine and Julie's mapping over the ancient sites. Oh, it's kind of neat too, that spot up north where I researched the Draco Stonehenge and that holy mountain. It also has uh, the world's leading candidate for King Solomon's lost gold mine. I know people are going to argue about that, but really it's no debate even in my mind about it, just because it's the second best gold in the world, and it's the, like the number one best hitting gold in the world. So the odds of it not being King Solomon's mine to me is pretty slim. So I was thinking this Draco Stonehenge line that I research, it'd be neat to see if it went across any gold type areas. And then I happened to notice that it almost lands directly on top of Fort Knox. And it's like, for anyone who doesn't know Fort Knox, I guess it's obvious, it's like the, the US's major spot where they store all the gold. And uh, it's kind of neat if you look up here on the image, I guess, I don't know if Freemasons were involved in building these runways, but when they built the runways, they made it intersect exactly where the Draco Stonehenge line goes. Like, you can see how precise it is, like right in the very middle. And that the general shape of this runway with the Draco Stonehenge line is almost the same as Solomon's seal. So I don't know if that's another clue, another coincidence, uh, could be either. All right, so yeah, I guess I'll show you guys this heat anomaly. You may have noticed where me and Julie's line intersect is also one of the, the tropic lines. And these tropic lines, people are probably wondering, like, how the heck did it manage to line up with that? These are just placed arbitrarily. But it's more like the, the prime meridian is placed uh, arbitrarily. These tropic lines are actually calculated very precisely, and I found out how they do it is, uh, see the equator line is anywhere you stand on this equator line at noon on the equinox, the, uh, what is it, the, it, the alignment will be directly above you at noon. So if you go to the Tropic of Cancer line and you stand anywhere on it, it's the day after, or before I believe, yeah, after I think, that if you stand on this line anywhere, you'll be exactly at noon at the equinox too. So there isn't really a, you can't say this is arbitrarily placed because it matches the equinoxes exactly. So it's kind of neat. All right, so. Maybe I'll check the slides. Where do I want to go next? Oh, yeah. So people are going to say, like, I'm picking this intersection point where Julie's line, my line, and the Tropic of Cancer meet. And people are, like, arguing, saying that, hey, this is just some random spot that you're placing. There's no evidence to show that there's actually something here, like, at this spot where everything's intersecting. And that's where I got this slide. It turns out that there's a giant heat anomaly at that exact lo location in the Gulf. And here's some of the numbers about the water temperature around it. And you can see that like scientists and everyone have been trying to figure out why it's so much hotter there and like what's the big deal about that spot. There's I think one other anomaly like this and yeah, somewhere close to India or something. But uh, yeah, so that's some of the evidence I have saying, hey, look, this spot that I picked where mine and Julie's line isn't just arbitrarily placed. It's right where an anomaly is. So I think that's more evidence that where I've got these lines placed right now is pretty damn close to where it should be. If this is something. All right, so um, yeah, the la I actually made a video about this and I was trying to link it up to Mexico City because I believe that's where Atlantis is. Like the, the ruins underneath Atlantis, or Mexico, is called Tiinoctitlan. And it's a really important city, like uh, the whole uh, Mexico coat of arms is basically the legend about how this city was formed. And it was the most amazing city in the world at one point, just like what uh, Atlantis was called. And I was like, hey, this uh, Mexico City place, or Atlantis, I could draw another line to it to the center and extend it to see where it goes. So I'll do that next.
so you guys can see. And I named this line the Atlantis line. Alright, so there we go. We've got the Mexico City line, or Atlantis, connecting where ours meets up. And let's see where else it goes. Doo -doo 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 -doo. You can see here it goes over a nice big island chain, the Azores. There's some ancient stuff there. It's debated whether it's ancient, but I think it is. And it's like, uh, oh, what do we have here? The line from Atlantis happens to end at beyond the Strait of Gibraltar, just like Plato said for where Atlantis is. And isn't it neat? It's like, does this mean that Plato knew that this line existed? I think that he did. <laughs> Anyways, I don't want to get too conspiratorial yet until I can show you some more evidence to back up my theories here. It's all about the evidence when it comes down to it, right? So anyways, this Atlantis line is going to go through a lot of famous ancient sites too. Let's see, it crosses some ocean ridges. Happens to cut across the bottom of Australia parallel. So I think that's a clue there that's helping shaping the continent. It happens to land directly on this island way out in the middle of nowhere, one of the biggest ones, and that's the French Polynesian Islands. So I don't know how many ancient ruins are there, but I bet you you wouldn't be out of luck if that's where you went to look for some. Alright, so that's basically the Atlantis line. I do it did a whole show about why I think the Atlantis is underneath Mexico and I've got crap loads of information for that. You could almost like do a three hour presentation, but I won't get into all the details for that because I want to show everyone the exact, like how everything's going here. I want to finish this presentation crap. We're already a half an hour into it, so I got to pick it up a little here. Okay. Yeah, so after adding those lines and I had the mega line, I'm starting to see a little bit of a pattern develop but I wasn't quite too sure about the pattern yet. And when I was going over my line and Julie's line over here, I happened to notice that there's a giant ocean ridge, like on the bottom here, going straight in between mine and Julie's line. So I was like, hey, that's kind of neat. Why don't I add a line there and see if it helps complete the pattern? And when I added that line, I'll show you where it goes. It happens to hit the edge of the Great Lakes. The majority of them of the Great Lakes are between mine and or the center line and the Draco line. It happens to cut across the edge of the Hudson Bay, maybe also forming it. And I'll spin us around here so you guys don't get too turned around. After it goes over the North Pole, yeah, sorry for the spinning around, I hope it's not making anyone nauseous. Goes to Russia, a couple ancient sites there. But the, the biggest one that it goes through happens to be, ta-da! Oh wait, this one isn't it. This is just a natural feature that it divides in between. Let's see, where is it? Ah, there it is. We happen to get this line going through right of, through the heart of Tibet and it happens to cross exactly over Tibet's most ancient and important temple. So it's like, I don't know, that's why I named it here the Tibet line. Because I figured that's kind of cool and neat that it does that. It divides right over Tibet's most ancient place. And a lot of the mountain ridges and stuff are going to follow that line. Yeah, it comes close to the mega line at one point there. I think there's some ancient sites there, but I won't get into too many details about that one. But here's where you can see, yeah, the Tibet line comes down, and it goes right over that ridge. So that's one of the reasons I think ocean ridges are also being affected by these lines of energy. Yeah, you can see, like, big islands are right close to where the line goes. And it's just slightly off center for where the, the Freemasons had put the line for when they drew up the globe. And it also comes close to the Galapagos Islands. And then back to where we are in South or uh, yeah, in America. 
Yeah, that's a better way to spin it. Okay, so if anyone hasn't noticed the pattern yet, we can sort of see that we're getting all these lines intersecting at the tropic point. And I was like, hey, when I added the Tibet line, it intersected with the mega line at the, the other tropic point. So I was like, holy, is this it? Did I happen to solve the pattern? And then I'm like, there's a whole bunch of lines coming out in like a orb pattern there. What happens if I copy that same pattern onto this one? So I guess I won't go over each line individually because I'm going to make this like a 10 hour video if I do. So I'll just add them all right at once. So I added all the extra lines at this point and I'll finish the lines from my point for all the gulf ones. Now this is where you can see like really obviously that these lines are, are shaping the continent. Like that line is cutting across there, that line is cutting across there. It's like basically anywhere these energy lines are going, it's shaping the continent itself. And I think that's why the gulf is there on its own too. It's because of this energy, it actually pushed the land away and made the gulf. And then here at this one, it might have pushed the land away, causing the continent to shift that way. See how they're pushing it that way? Now the lines for where the continents have drifted match in that direction. So, yeah, I don't want to go over each one of these lines because, man, I'm going to be here all day. It's like at first when I started making this map, I'm like, oh, this is going to be easy. I'm just going to draw in like three or four lines and be done. But it's like, man, each one of these lines goes over these island spots where they intersect. Oh, yeah, I guess I should do this too. Before I skip too far ahead, it's like we got Julie's Montana line, the Tibet line, the Draco Stonehenge line, and the one next to it, guess what it is? It's the regular Stonehenge line, the one in England. And you can see where it goes. It's like dividing the continent in two, like going directly parallel with a lot of stuff. And here's where it gets into the Stonehenge area. Yeah, see there's Dublin and Stonehenge is across from it. So I believe it's like right around in there. I would put it on here, but it's almost guaranteed to crash my computer. Oh, it's neat. Paris is right on one of those. So maybe Paris was an ancient city at one point too. Frankfurt was on the line. Oh, I'm switching lines here. This is the Stonehenge line and it goes through. It's neat how it lands right on Munich. And what is that? The part of Germany? Or is that Switzerland? No, it's Germany. I should know how part of Germany. And it goes through Austria, Slovenia, Croatia. And this is kind of neat too. It's like it hits Belgrade. When it goes through Bulgaria, Bulgaria is another spot like where Freemasonry began. Like the Rosicrucians and all of them, they were all like in ancient times in Bulgaria. And this line going through Bulgaria is also going to run parallel with the mountain chains there. It's neat they have a place there called Montana too. Yeah, so there's a lot of cool spots in Bulgaria if anyone wants to check it out. I won't get into too much detail about that. It's neat when it goes through, uh, what is it, Greece or in that area. Or no, that's not Greece. Let's say it goes through Turkey and then it gets into this area near Lebanon. There's a temple of Zeus and it happens to go right through that temple. And there was a whole bunch of places, what was it? along there that it goes through ancient sites. It's running parallel with the, the ocean lines or ridges. More ridge lines that it's parallel with there. It's hitting some big islands. Let's see which island this is. The Auckland Island. <laughs> disappointment Island. Yeah, I hope people don't find this research too boring and disappointing. Okay. Yeah, so that's basically the Stonehenge line. I thought that was kind of neat that uh, so many of these lines are really cool. That it's like we got the Montana line, Tibet line, Draco Stonehenge line, uh, the regular one, the Atlantis line. Hmm. 
Alright, so maybe I, before I continue on much further on these, we'll get into a few more slides. Alright, 40 minutes, that's not so bad. Okay, here's just a slide I put up, like, the first video I made, talking about these lines. It basically went viral on Disclosed TV. It's like, Disclosed TV doesn't get huge audiences, but mine uh, managed to get, like, close to the top of what they have. They sent me a congratulation notice, and there's a lot of positive feedback in the comments. Like, this was, like, almost a thousand hits in a, in a day, basically. And then, uh, or a couple of days. And then, um... Yeah, there was just pages and pages of comments. And all the comments I was getting were like a lot of really positive feedback. And at this point, I really hadn't gotten any negative feedback or anything like that. But I'll get into that part soon. Yeah, here's like uh, some of the negative feedback. I got this weird message from YouTube saying that they removed my video. So I was like, oh, that was weird. It's like they did it almost simultaneously as I posted it. So it's like, I don't know how it could have gotten flagged at the exact same time. So I think that was just coincidence, maybe some sort of error with Facebook. And there's the picture of the, the Atlantis line, just showing how it collects, or goes so close to the Strait of Gibraltar, and runs straight to Tiananmen, just like uh, Plato had said. It even goes near the Bimini Road. So I think that's really wild. Like uh, Edgar Casey was talking about that. Yeah, and here's a picture of, like, the globe, and I was just showing how, like, uh, you can see a lot of these lines from the different patterns that I've made are always shaping the continents. It's really wild how that works. Oh, yeah, here's where it's really going to start getting interesting. It's like everyone, well, who's made it this far has probably heard about the, the Piri Reese map before. It's like an ancient map. So I would heard about that map before, too. And I was like, hey, wouldn't it be neat to draw like an orb around where each point of these are intersecting? And I was like, hey, that kind of reminds me of the Piri Reese map. So I'll show you. And that, yeah, it turns out the Piri Reese map had the same orb designs, except when I was drawing them, I only drew the blue lines. So Piri Reese on his map, he has double the amount of lines, but the exact like distance between them in each and like the basic same patterns. Like you can see in South America here, it's like these orb lines are matching exactly where mine did. So I was like, holy crap, it's like these orb patterns that I'm finding are solving Piri Reese's map. Like people looked at these orbs and had no idea what, why they were drawn on Piri Reese's map before. And I guess I should get into some of the details about that. For anyone who hasn't heard about the Piri Reese map, this is what it is. It was a map of the world compiled in 1513 the, during the Ottoman Empire. Like, uh, it was basically when the Muslims were going around and conquering everything. They uh, collected a whole bunch of the maps and uh, they compiled them all together. And I think what happened was uh, when Piri Reis made this map, he didn't have the exact like globe idea to go with. So when he started putting the maps together, a lot of these orbs just got placed arbitrarily or like he tried to make it fit on a flat plane instead of a globe. So that's why it's like slightly off, but it's not off by much. And it's neat. Everyone's like, holy crap, there was a map of the world like that long ago. And it's like, yeah, people argue that Christopher Columbus actually had a copy of this map so that when he was a... Uh, finding America, he didn't find it by chance. He already knew it was there. And that was like kind of the theory too, like the Freemasons already had these maps all along too. If Christopher Columbus might have been a Freemason, then he would have a copy of it that way. Yeah, it talks about all the different sources where he got these maps from. Uh, I'll skip ahead. Yeah, and here's just a comparison to show you like these orb patterns that I made and Perry Reese made are almost identical. And here's like showing, yeah, like there we go. Where you can see a South America's line is going like that on Perry Reese's map, and mine also matches the same general direction. And he's got a crap more lines drawn on his map, and I tried doing it on my map, and technically I could, but it just clutters it so badly that you're going to have lines everywhere. So it's like I might as well just put in half of the lines so people can see that there actually is a pattern to it before I start flooding it and making it too complex. 
And here's like once you add in like all of the lines, you start getting the exact shape of the continent. That one's mapping that angle, that one's mapping that, that one's that. It's like people are gonna try to deny it at this point, and I think it's like, how can you deny it? It's like there it is, right? <laughs> it's neat to when I was uh, making the cover for this, I'm like, hey, the civilization Peter Viscott is mapped from knew more about the world than we do today. And I was thinking those Anunnaki guys, the Magi show that I always, like my show is titled after, the guy in the wind disc is coming out of an orb, and he's holding an orb in his hand too, or like a ring. And I was like, isn't that a neat coincidence? So maybe that's a clue that these points where all the energy coming out can actually be used as portals too, for like the Anunnaki to pass through. I know in most cases the Anunnaki when it came to going through portals went through smaller ones like mirrors that witches used like cauldrons, stuff like that. Anything with reflective surfaces they were able to travel through, sort of like the poltergeist movies. I wonder if that's another thing from the Freemasons they knew about the reflection of things. And it's wild too, like uh, there's the Sumerian, like Anunnaki, Mesopotamian stuff and people are always trying to figure out what these orbs were. Here's like a, a giant Anunnaki guy giving a measuring tool and an orb and he's like showing a picture of like an orb and these types of patterns with lines. People are like, what is that? What is that? It's like, well, I don't, I don't know. Now that we got these lines and orbs figured out, I'm pretty sure that's what that would be. And it's neat too. Everyone's like, what are these wristwatches that the Anunnaki guys are wearing? It happens to be an orb with the same line patterns. So I'm pretty sure that's what those are too. I don't know, it's like this solves the Puri Reese map, it solves the Anunnaki wristwatch, it solves the giant scrolls. Yeah, it's basically solving way more than I thought it was going to. Yeah, and when I was making these lines, I was trying to figure out like what is the pattern that I'm drawing here. And these are a couple of the sacred geometry patterns that I was thinking that I might be developing. It's like the seed and the tree of life. I think it's very similar to that, the flower of life the metronon's cube, the fruit of life. There's a couple of them that are close. And then when I was yeah looking at it on this angle, I'm like, hey, it sort of looks very similar to torsion fields. That's what that one is there. And it's also very similar to magnetic fields. And there's the, the metronon cube again. And it's also very similar to the, the atom pattern that we always show. So I don't know for sure. I'm not claiming to be a know-it-all here. It's like, if anything, I'm like, Forrest Gump trying to figure out stuff, so I'm not claiming to be a genius or anything, if anything, quite the opposite. <laughs> Alright, so I guess we'll continue on. Oh yeah, that Stonehenge line. It's like, yeah, that Stonehenge line, after it passes uh, Stonehenge, it comes to the Long Man of Wilmington. And for people who don't know, it's like this Long Man of Wilmington, it's like he's popular in a whole bunch of uh, ancient uh, drawings where they're always holding their arms out like that. And that's basically the serious stance showing that's where, uh, like how, how they gathered information sort of thing, information like from the Akashic records. And I was like, it's neat how those lines run through this line pattern that this guy is like holding two lines. I was like, where have I heard of that before? It's like, hmm, something to do with magnetic fields, wasn't it? I was like, oh yeah, Coral Castle, Edward Leedscallet. It's like one of the symbols that he put for how to harness the energy that he used to build, like megalithic stones. I guess I skipped it ahead. It's like Edward Leedscallet. He's this guy from, from uh, what was it, somewhere in Latvia or Europe somewhere. And uh, he was sickly and he came to America and he almost died. But in the process, uh, he managed to recover. He developed this ability to uh, build the pyramids. Like he learned the exact same methods that they used. And I guess he used to brag about it, that he was like the first person in modern times who managed to crack the code of how the pyramids and all the different megaliths were built. And then those two lines, it's like, that reminds me of the Wilmington. It's like, I think, Edward Leeds Scallon had figured out this line power or pattern as well, and he was harnessing it, and that's how he built Coral Castle. Yeah, here's a quote from him. He says, he discovered the secrets of the pyramids, 
He found out how the Egyptians and the ancient builders in Peru, Yucatan, Asia, and with only primitive tools raised and set in place blocks of stone weighing many tons. So yeah, it's like, even Edward Leeds Scallon is like giving a clue here. He's like, hey, all these ancient sites are connected. Egypt, Peru, Yucatan, even Asia. So I don't know. It's like people are going to argue maybe that I'm way off on that, but yeah, it could be. And then uh, here we have a picture of Coral Castle. So if people are wondering, basically Ed somehow got into the ocean. Like, I guess this was around Florida. So he was able to get a uh, coral, like cut right out of the, the ocean or near the ocean and giant blocks of it and built like huge, like monumental things that some hundred pound guy could never build. But yeah, they weighed like several tons and he was all able to build to cut them and move them all on his own. And he was bragging that he was able to harness some sort of supernatural ability. And it was neat. There was kids that tried to sneak up on Ed and see how he had built the, the coral castle, like watch him work while they thought he wasn't looking. And they said they could never sneak up on him. He had some sort of paranormal ability that any time, no matter how careful they were, he would always catch them watching. So it's like uh, they wondered if he was like demonic or something. Yeah, it's kind of a sad story, I guess, too. It's like uh, Edward Leeds Scallon built this whole thing as like for some woman that he fell in love with and she left him on his wedding day and he did it all over a broken heart. So it's kind of neat. Like, I guess a broken heart can motivate people to do stuff. <laughs> Won't get into too much of that, but uh, yeah. So then I was thinking too, it's like Edward Leeds Scallon, he's a pretty famous guy. It's like, I should check to see if Nikola Tesla, like he's a famous inventor all into harnessing energy lines. Maybe he was into this too. So uh, here we have like a quote, I guess, from Nikola Tesla. A good example for such an interaction becomes apparent in gravitation, which should rather be named universal compression. So I guess he didn't agree with gravity. I think the material bodies do not gravitate between each other, but is the ether that makes one material body to press to another. We wrongly call this phenomenon gravitation. So isn't that wild? Eh? It's like even Nikola Tesla was arguing that the theories we're using for gravity are wrong. I don't want to get too much into Einstein and stuff, but I happen to live like really close to like the world's most advanced theoretical physics center called the, was it the Stephen Hawking Center? And I go there all the time and like go on the tours and see like what are the world's most advanced theoretical physicists into so I can like copy the research and try to get as much information as I can from the source. And I wasn't really too impressed with a lot of the stuff they were coming up with because they just repeat Einstein's theories over and over again. They're like, oh, we repeat everything Einstein says, and somehow we ran into a brick wall. It's like, oh, I don't know, maybe you guys should try looking into Tesla. <laughs> and it's funny, even Einstein himself said that uh, he was asked if he was the smartest man alive. And he says, no, it's like, you'll have to ask Nikola Tesla. Yeah, it's pretty funny. Now, one of my theories about Einstein is he worked at the patent office, had a form of autism that allowed him to memorize everything like that he got his hands on. So that's why he seemed so smart, even though he was just like a, a memorizing machine. All right. So, um, yeah, I talked earlier in the, this show about the, the prime meridian and where it was located. So I tried to look it up to see, like, it says here it's passing through the, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. But the spot that it's chosen could be anywhere. So I was like, huh. They say it could have been anywhere, but that's not what I'm finding from my map. It's like uh, here we have the Tibet line and that prime meridian line. They make an exact 90 degrees. So whoever put this prime meridian line knew exactly where the Tibet line was. So I think that's kind of neat. Like, I don't know. They're going to say it was arbitrarily placed, but it sure doesn't seem that way to me. All right, so we'll get on to the next one. Yeah, it turns out this guy was the one, Sir George Airy, in 1851. He placed the Prime Meridian. I don't know, I guess I'd have to do more research into him to find out if he was really a Freemason or not. 
Oh well, yeah, I guess uh, <laughs> maybe I skipped a little bit too far ahead. I'll get to that in a sec. Yeah, so some people are going to debate, like I've heard questions in these different posts that I posted. People are like, hey, these lines are like going over mountains and they're going over ridges and stuff, but they're everywhere on the surface of the planet, so the odds of it happening are just going to be normal, right? But then I looked it up and it turns out that mountains aren't everywhere. It's like they only make up 20% of the dry land. So for these lines to go over them all the time in parallel, that ain't just some coincidence unless it's like an astronomical odds. <sighs> all right, so I guess before I get into the end of the slides, I'll go over... Yeah, I guess I should check, see if there's anything else I wanted to show. Um, when anyone else gets a copy of this map, I guess I'll, I'll throw on the rest of the lines so people can see. It's like it turned out that uh, these two orbs aren't the only ones. I started adding more. Like I noticed that the distance between them was even. So I'm like, hey, I should start adding more about the same distance apart to see how those look. And that's where I got those lines. Those are the equator lines. And there's a Northern Canada one, there's a North Pole one, a South Pole one, and then all the different orbs I drew. So you can tell that the, the map itself isn't finished yet. There's still a lot to draw the orbs around each one. There's the, like I could go over for hours going over each ancient site and mountain line that these crisscross. You can sort of get the point like here, like you can even see it like all these lines are mapping the continents. It's like these ones here, you can definitely tell it's mapping those. Well, let's see. Oh yeah, and if anyone's wondering about the symbol on my shirt too, this is like the ancient Bulgarian symbol I was talking about earlier, Bulgaria. And I think that solves this symbol too. People are trying to figure out what that symbol was. Because it's like, uh, well, there's a lot of different theories on it. The Tantra God, it gets into the Magi stuff too. But I think that's what it is, is that this symbol here is showing those line patterns. Yeah, so if anyone uh, wants to make this map themselves, they got an idea now of the, the formulas that I use to make this map. And if anyone wants to adjust it slightly, because I got it wrong, I'm not trying to say I'm like the king of this pattern. If I got it wrong, I'm sure, adjust a little bit more, but I think pretty close I got it. Maybe within a few degrees per line. All right, so yeah, I guess I'm gonna start wrapping up the video. Before I get into the last slide, I guess I'll go into my notes and just say my special thanks to everyone. So Julie Ryder was a huge help with this. Uh, her website is montanamegalist.com. Guess I'll minimize this. And uh, Amy Lee, yeah, she was one of my page uh, readers and she helped a lot explaining uh, how I should ex extend the line to the medicine wheel. That really triggered a, a whole lot of things to happen. Oh, Lord Spade's here. Hey man, that's one of my friends from the Entropia game. He joined in. Um, I guess this video is running really long, so I'll try to get to your questions as soon as uh, I finish. I'm just going to wrap it up here. And then, yeah, Professor Bill Steer, he helped me out with this research a ton. It's like he was the guy that uh, found the Stonehenge up north that I was researching. And he's an actual professor, so it's not just Leland, the... <laughs> The grass cutting janitor who discovered it was actually a professor, not just me. And then uh, we got here, oh yeah, Lucien Khan. He's the guy who was t teaching me about the metronome cube, basically that sacred geometry pattern that we went over that could be what this is. So if anyone wants to check out his work, he has a book called The 216, The Letter, or uh, The 216 Letter, The Hidden Name of God. I believe that's the, the title of his book. It's for sale on Amazon if anyone wants to get a copy. It's got a lot of really good reviews. Um, whoa, <laughs> he's been in here. Yeah, my buddy from Entropia has been in for 
Since five minutes in, wow. All right, man. Thanks a lot for watching. I appreciate it. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, Lucian Khan, he helped me with uh, the, the sacred geometry. And then we had that mega line that I talked about, the, the one that's the most popular that goes through all the pyramids. Sorry, my back's just leaking. And it's, uh, yeah, the documentary for that one is called The Revelation of the Pyramids. So if anyone wants to look it up on YouTube, they can watch it there. I think uh, it might be the full version's not on YouTube, but the clip showing the mega line is. And it's also Adept Initiates, uh, the group that I do writing with. They've been helping me share all this information about lines that I discovered in the pattern. So big thanks to them for helping. And yeah, I guess uh, the only negative comments I got, some people started sharing saying that I shouldn't be telling people about these lines because it's super dangerous. And then it's like it actually could come to harm me in the end. But it's like this has pretty much been my life's work. And... I've been working on it for about 30 years, so I wasn't really just about to quit at, at the the top. Uh, just the, the suggestion that someone's going to hurt me because of it. So I just want to put that out there that this could be dangerous information and just be, sure, I guess, careful with who you share it with. And one of the main reasons it's so dangerous, I'll just show it to people. I guess I shouldn't tell people because it's going to make it even more dangerous, but I don't really believe in covering stuff up, so... I'm just going to say it as it is, and hopefully it doesn't cause a huge disaster. But it's like, if you take these lines and you map it with the megalithic portal where all the ancient sites are, I'll just turn it on. In some cases, it's like you can see that they're, they've already been mapped. But if all these lines are intersecting at spots where it hasn't, like an ancient spot isn't marked yet, the chances are that there is a spot there, it just hasn't been discovered yet. So you can see how this information or map would be so dangerous, because like if grave robbers get a hold of it, they're basically going to have a map showing where all the gold is buried in ancient tombs around the world, including the ones discovered and the ones not discovered yet. So that's potentially a pretty dangerous thing, and I guess uh, I really shouldn't be telling people, but... I guess the world's kind of reaching the point now where it's like we're at the, the breaking point anyways, in my opinion. Like there's so much crap going on, like so much stress. Like if this information is going to help solve how the earth works, maybe it's the time that we need it. Like we'll figure out how the continents are moving, how more mountain chains form, how volcanoes work, why earthquakes are where they are. It's like all these energy lines are the pattern that scientists have been looking for, I think, for... I guess centuries trying to solve all these mysteries. So that's one of the main reasons that I continue sharing the research. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just getting a little bit stressed out for the end of the show here, but I guess I'll try to go through it quick so I don't get too emotional. It's like I did this uh, video and it happened to fall on what is it, uh, Suicide Prevention Day. <clears throat> Yeah, and suicide's been a pretty big part of my life. Like, I lost my best friend to suicide. Yeah, and he was actually telling me that all this research I was doing was like, causing him a lot of stress. Because people, when they hear your research and these weird mysteries and stuff, they're usually not going to take it well. They're going to call you crazy and stuff. Like, me and my best friend, like, everyone knew us as, like, like Cheech and Chong or, like, uh, Harold and Kumar. Like, we were the two guys that everyone associated with each other. So, like, when I first met my best friend, it was, like, during a time when I wasn't doing this research. And then I started doing it, like, maybe halfway through our friendship. And then he got really upset about it because people were making fun of him, too. Like, saying, your friend's crazy, so you must be crazy, too. Sorry, I just gotta grab a drink. So I don't know. <clears throat> if this research is accurate, I pretty much like to dedicate it to his memory. Just so it wasn't for nothing. <sighs> okay, so I guess I'll move on to another subject so I can keep talking. Yeah, some people asked if they wanted to to donate money to all this research that I did on this. 
and I'll feel right about it. So if anyone wants to donate money, they can just donate it to something like suicide hotlines and stuff. I think that would be a big help and good for my friend's memory. Okay, so I guess I'll try to wrap up the show now. Sorry for breaking down like that. Yeah, so if anyone else wants to help share this research, just be careful. Like, I don't want to get people into trouble and have other people after you guys, too. It's like, I don't really worry too much about that kind of stuff because, like, I'm six foot two and, like, 200 pounds, built like a tank, so I don't really have to worry, but unless someone's going to use a gun or something. But I don't know if, like, if you're already a paranoid person, it's like you probably shouldn't be sharing this information because you could start getting threats and stuff, so... I don't know, hopefully it might just go viral and everyone will know about it, and then at that point it's not really going to be dangerous to any one person. So I don't know, I'm going to keep trying to share it, and if you guys don't want to, I don't blame you, it's like, who knows what kind of trouble it could get people into, so. And hopefully it's nothing, like, maybe this really is the time that the world is supposed to, to find out this information, and that'll be a, that'll be the, like the, the kicker, I don't know how to think finish up this show but yeah I guess I'll just put on the title here all right thanks everyone for watching the show and I'm gonna try finishing the map but it's, it's I put into like 80 hours into it already and, and I did it in like I don't know a week or two so it's like I pretty much went crazy trying to look at spinning globes so I can't do it anymore I'm gonna have to take a break for a while at least for a few weeks maybe even months or until my concussion symptoms are over with See, I got a bit of a scar still from it. So, anyways, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for watching. And if you want to help share the video and you want to check out more information about the ancient sites, like my YouTube channel is full of my different research on the Draco Stonehenge, King Solomon's Gold Mine, Atlantis. And I really wonder if this is what all of this has helped solve. Like, like, like the title says, it's like uh, this could have solved the Piri Reis map. The straight lines around the globe connect all the ancient sites. Mountains, ocean ridges, volcanoes, islands, earthquakes, and the very shape of the continents. Possibly solving Atlantis and connecting to the Anunnaki. And I don't know if the, the Freemasons really are in a conspiracy to conceal the truth to this, because it appears like the like a lot of these lines were incorporated into modern constructions as well, like Fort Knox. So Obviously, I think someone else already has a copy of this map, and what I discovered mapping Google Earth with the Piri Reis map is nothing new. It's just a lot of people haven't shared it publicly yet. And I, I'm pretty sure, like, the whole reason with the gold robbing and the grave robbing and stuff, that's probably why they're not sharing it. And I'd just like to apologize, I guess, for all the trouble that that's probably going to cause, almost undoubtedly. But it's like I really had no choice. So, okay, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, I got to work tomorrow, so I'm probably going to be going to bed soon. But thanks for watching, everyone, and I'll try to get to some questions in the chat after. All right, take care, and have a good night. See you later.